in Cameroon, the man who calls himself leader of the legitimate interim government of Ambazonia says his group will attend Canada's sponsor peace talks between separatist groups and authorities in Yaoundé. Canada's Foreign Minister Melanie Jolie broke the news on Friday, but Chris Anu, formerly Secretary of State for Communication for the group, tells me he is going into the talks as a representative of an independent southern Cameroon, not as the northwest and southwest regions of the country. James, when these so-called pre-talks first uh, came up, we were invited by the Canadian government to participate in the talks. But the agenda was not clear, and we decided then not to participate. Now that the Canadian government has stepped out to say the formal talks will now start and every party should be on the table, we are ready to go in and to lead the process in a way that when we come out, Ambazonians will know they were effectively and efficiently represented. So, yes, we will be there to speak for Ambazonia. There has been negotiations sponsored by, I think, the Swiss. Is this one by the Canadians going to be different, or do you hope? We know what the Swiss mediation was all about. Until we get to Canada and get to formulate the agenda, I cannot say right now what it is going to look like. But the good thing is that nobody is going to dictate the agenda of the Canadian uh, process to us. We, with the other parties being Cameroon, would have to decide what the agenda is. Let me make it very clear. We are going into this process not to ask for Cameroon to give us some special status or the Canadian example. We are going into this talks as Southern Cameroon, a country that gained independence in 1961. We are not going in there as the northwest and southwest regions of Cameroon. That was Chris Anu, the man who calls himself leader of the legitimate interim government of Ambazonia. He was speaking with us from the U.S. city of Houston in Texas. A democracy and human rights activist says most citizens of Cameroon's northwest and southwest English-speaking regions are ecstatic over news that some separatist groups and the national government have agreed to peace talks to be facilitated by Canada. Barrister Abba Bala is president of the Center for Human Rights and Development in Africa. He says despite a few skeptics, reaction has been overwhelmingly positive, especially in the southwestern town of Boya. Bala tells me that people in the English-speaking regions are tired of the six-year-old conflict that has killed more than 6,000 people, and they want to return to their normal lives. My immediate reaction is one of excitement, one of happiness. Don't forget, Canada has um, a long history with Cameroon, diplomatic relations between Cameroon. Canada and Cameroon are officially the countries that speak French and English. And Canada has not been interfering in the internal politics of Cameroon. Canada is held in very high esteem in Cameroon. Canada was one of the financiers of the failed Swiss process. So Canada is not new in the process of finding a long-lasting solution to the conflict taking place in Cameroon. The former Canadian ambassador Richard Bell was very, very involved in empowering civil society and women's and youth groups working towards peace in the country. So this is wonderful. I'm excited. I can't wait for the process to come to a logical conclusion, a logical end with peace being restored in Southwest and the Northwest region. What do you think is the reaction of the ordinary Cameroonian in the region where this conflict is uh, most affecting them? How do you think they might react to the fact that there might be a peace process on the way? So it's overwhelmingly positive, you know. You can see from social media, I tweeted on it and I, I posted it on Facebook. Other activists have tweeted and, and posted it. The reaction is overwhelmingly positive. It's a step in the right direction. This is what everybody wanted. There's a lot of euphoria. I've been talking to people in, in Boya. Everybody's excited. I know there are a few people who were skeptical, of, but majority of the population don't want it. The people are tired. They want to go back to their normal lives. They want peace to be given a chance. Barisal Akbar Bala is president of the Center for Human Rights and Development in Africa. He was speaking with us from the town of Boya in southwestern Cameroon.
A series of bombs went off in the capital of Somalia on Sunday afternoon, followed by gunfire. The militant group Al-Shabaab claims its fighters have entered the mayor's office in downtown Mogadishu. Ahmed Mohammed reports from Mogadishu, Somalia. Witnesses in Somalia's capital say at least four bombs went off near the Mogadishu mayor's office Sunday afternoon. People in the area say that a vehicle loaded with explosives blew up near the city administration's headquarter. The explosion was followed by heavy gunfire. There was no immediate reports on casualties and government officials have not commented on the incident. Gunfire can be still heard in the area amid unconfirmed reports that the militants may have entered the building. The militant group Al-Shabaab has claimed the responsibility for the attack and said through its affiliate news website that fighters had entered the mayor's office. Today's attack is the second one targeting the city administration headquarters. In July 2019, a suicide bomber blew herself up during a staff meeting, killing the mayor and several other top officials. Ahmed Mohammed for VOA News, Mogadishu, Somalia. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I'm James Butte in Washington. Today is Monday, January 23rd. And still to come on our program, something O'Malley's Force. In Liberia, the man often referred to as the kingmaker in presidential elections has given a new reason why he will not support the re-election of President George Weah. Longtime Senator Prince Johnson says in the six years since he was elected, Weah has failed to bring investors to Liberia, thereby worsening the country's unemployment rate. Supporters say the president has focused on the country's development through his government's pro-poor agenda for prosperity and development. The new development comes after Johnson says a high-power delegation from the ruling CDC urged his party not to field a presidential candidate because it will hurt President Weah's re-election chances. Johnson tells me the delegation included several top ministers, including those from the ministries of finance, labor, a former minister of state, and the chair of the ruling CDC. We have a candidate, Stanley Dera, to run directly. And they are saying, no, we should not run. We should support Mr. Weir. If we do, it's an affront to Mr. Weir and all kinds of talks. And we say we are a party registered under the law of this country. And our support from 2017, October, it ended October 2022. So there is no more document binding. And during this six-year period this year, we have observed that what we expected in the past is not what we see on the ground. We are believe, as well as the Liberian people believe, that being the world best, European best, African best, all the best, that this election will have attracted investors to Liberia to create jobs and alleviate the suffering of our people through their investment and employment. But since this election, the world has abandoned us in the sense that no investors are coming. And what we're doing in the country is just ratifying loan agreements all the time. And you cannot build a country based on loan and internal revenue in the private sector. So things are very difficult in the country. The unemployment rate is escalating. So there's nothing encouraging to give me the real second term. That's how we decide to quit. Senator, help me. You said a delegation from the ruling CDC came to see you. Who are the members on that delegation? Well, the Minister of Finance, the former Minister of State for the Affairs, the chairperson of the CDC, Mr. Neva <laughs> Malou, Professor Wilson Tapper, EPA, Director General, the Minister of Labor, Minister Charles Gibson, and many others. Senator, how do you say there's no development as recent as I think uh, earlier this month? The president dedicated a hospital. I see pictures of uh, is, roads is being paved. Jimmy, that's a different thing. I'm not saying there is no development. There are some level of development. I am saying the high rate of unemployment is a major concern. When investors are not on the ground to provide jobs that we are living with sufferings. We're talking about jobs for our people. The jobs we put food on the table. The jobs we help our people, those university graduates every year, when they graduate no job, their degrees are hanging on the walls and they continue to increase the number of unemployment. Let me ask you, uh, Senator, in the past you have supported President Weah. And this is the reason why I think people accused you of selling your Niba vote for money. 
Some people are saying you are making all this noise because now you want the government to give you more money. That's what I hear people say, but they are on the wrong side of history. That is not my nature. I don't know of any market where they sell votes. They say these things, but is that true? If I form an alliance with you, I collaborate with you, and I offer incompatibility, coupled with that, the agreement expires, I can no longer renew that agreement. But why not support uh, one of the parties? I mean, how certain are you that your candidates might win? We are open to all parties. We are working with ANC. We are working with the Unity Party. We are working with the newly certificated party, EFCC. All of the parties on the ground, we are working with them. So one party cannot win with all the other in the country. So you mean all hands on deck. Senator Johnson, it is always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much. Happy New Year again to you. Happy New Year. God bless you, Jimmy. That was Senator Frank Johnson of Liberia speaking with us from the capital, Moravia. Nigerian authorities say such teams are going after armed men holding four students out of six kidnapped from their school on Friday. The attack is one of many violent incidents reported in Nigeria in the past week as the country gears up for elections next month. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja. Nazareth State's Police Commissioner Miyaki Mohamed Bala told VOA Sunday that the teams, including the military, police and civil defense and locals, searched a nearby forest in the state for a second day for the remaining students. Armed men on Friday attacked the local Education Authority Primary School, Alwaza, in the Doma District while the children were reporting to school and kidnapped six pupils. Schools are often targets to ransom-driven armed gangs with a reputation of notoriety in central and northwest Nigeria. Baba said state authorities have also fortified schools to prevent a repeat of the incident. Security forces on Saturday rescued two girls who were abducted and reunited them with their families after a medical examination. Baba spoke to Vioe by phone. So far, we are putting on intensive effort to ensure that we rescue the remaining ones. They are all in the bush now, on trail of the, the, the suspects. Uh, uh, provide guards from all our schools around the area to ensure that uh, such things do not repeat itself again. The United Nations estimates more than 1,500 school students have been kidnapped mostly in northern Nigeria since late 2020. Most of them have been freed through negotiations, but some are still being held. Farmers and herders also frequently clash over land and scarce resources in Nasarawa State. Nigerian authorities have been struggling to stem a wave of violence just weeks ahead of elections scheduled for February 25th. Security has been a major topic among campaigners. Timothy Obezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. A political leader in Eswatini says the government is trying to silence the voices of pro-democracy groups by killing their leaders. Busi Maisala is the first woman to form a political party in Eswatini, the Swazi's first democratic front. Earlier this month, her party's deputy secretary general was assassinated. On Saturday, human rights lawyer Tulani Maseko, chairperson of the multi-stakeholders forum, was murdered in his own home. The forum has been demanding a mediated political dialogue, a total unbanning of political parties, and a new democratic constitution. Mayisela tells me the group is aware of reports that King Mswati III has hired foreign mercenaries to kill pro-democracy leaders. I'm still waiting for concrete information about the whole episode. But what we were told last night is that he was shot at his home in front of his children and his wife. Apparently someone came and um, shot him through his window around half past 11 last night. And this happened in Eswatini? In Eswatini, in his home, yes. This must be frightening. I mean, there's been a number of killings, including even your own deputy secretary general. What is happening? Uh, it seems now the government has taken a stance to assassinate and kill the leaders. That's how it looks like, but we're still waiting for investigation. What we are aware as well that our newspapers is reporting this morning is that government is welcoming mercenaries from Russia to deal with the issue of terrorism in the country. 
Most of them are expected to arrive on the 23rd of January. Otherwise, we have a lot of uh, foreign police that are now doing the abduction and brutality in the country. I did speak with the government spokesperson last week, I think so, and asked the question about the allegation about these foreign mercenaries, and he denied that. Yes, government is denying, but now he has said it's foreigners that are coming to help the government to calm the issue of the situation about terrorism in the country. It is now in the newspapers, the front page of the Times this morning. If the issue is terrorism, I'm going to be talking with him. If the issue is terrorism, Masiko, was he a terrorist or a political opposition? No, he was. No, he was not a terrorist at all. Actually, he didn't like violence. He was a human rights lawyer. That's what he was all his life. And he only stood with the people and spoke the, the truth. So there was no reason for and no need to kill him because he wasn't violent at all. Politically, this must be frightening for those of you who are trying to see a fair playing field in politics in, in Eswatini. What do you do next? Yes, I think basically what they're trying to do is to stop people from speaking. They are silencing the voices in the country and the voices that are calling for democracy. They are making sure that it doesn't exist at all by frightening the people and killing the leaders. That was Busi Mayisela, founder and president of the Swazi's first Democratic Front Party, Eswatini's first female-led political party. She was speaking with us from the capital, Mbabani. The government of Eswatini, formerly Swaziland, is condemning what it calls the ruthless killing of innocent civilians. On Saturday, human rights lawyer Tulani Maseko, chairperson of the Multi-Stakeholders Forum, was assassinated in his own home. This follows several other murders, including an army officer. Some in the opposition have accused the government of trying to silence the voices of pro-democracy groups by killing their leaders. Government spokesperson Alfius Zumalo says the administration does not kill its own citizens. He says security forces already are at work to find the killer or killers. Government will know or have a clue what has actually taken place at Tulane Masego's residential place after the investigations have been taken place. Our National Security Police Force have assured us as government that uh, there are leads that are showing that uh, probably by the close of next week, the nation should have some ideas or some conclusions as to what exactly has happened at Babi Masego's residence. This will be perhaps the second investigation now, assassination... No, 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 let me correct you. Point of correction. It's not going to be the a second investigation. We are, we are investigating in this country 15 cases of mischievous murders, which include our national security officers, some who were assassinated during broad daylight. Just last week, when I was speaking with you, I reminded you that a command of a military camp at Bunya was also assassinated mischievously. So it's, it's not two investigations. It's actually 15 investigations one amongst which includes a chief, which is a community leader in our traditional setup. Let me go back to that question then, because I I wanted to ask you about the investigation you launched about the assassination of the Deputy Secretary General of the Swazi First Democratic Front Party. What has happened so far in the investigation? In the immediate past uh, two weeks, government arrested five suspects, one of whom was shot while he was resisting arrest. So these five suspects are assisting our national security service officers with information which we believe as government that will help us or lead us to more breakthroughs in terms of arresting the criminals that are murdering people in this country. So when we spoke the last time, I asked about whether your government has hired foreigners to beef up your security forces. No, no, no. You did not ask me that question. Let me remind you again. It's me who actually corrected you to say every government will have exchange programs with other specialists from other countries' military expertise. You asked me rather about the question of hitmen who were hired by government to assassinate members of the opposition. And I categorically stated to you that there is absolutely no truth or fact in that narrative. Government has not hired any hitmen. Government does not need to hire any hitmen in any case. 
if there is a need to hit people because we are a fully fledged state which have got all organs in place which can be given instructions to carry out certain operations. There is no need for any of our government to go and hire hitmen from any country. Althias Ndumalo is the Eswatini government spokesperson. He was speaking with me from the capital, Mbabani. <music> Stand down for Daybreak Africa Sports and here is something Omali in Abuja, Nigeria. A very good Monday morning to you, something. Good Monday morning to you too, James. We begin the sports in Algeria where Senegal and Ivory Coast qualified for the African Nations Championship champ quarterfinals on Sunday in Algeria. Senegal, who began the final round in Group B, lying second, trounced two-time former champions the Democratic Republic of Congo 3-0 in the eastern city of Anaba. The surprisingly comfortable victory elevated the Senegalese to first and a last eight showdown with the Group D winners, probably Mali, this Friday. Ivory Coast were lost in the standings as they kicked off against then-leaders Uganda, but a 3-1 triumph lifted them to second and qualification for the knockout phase. The Ivorians will now face Algeria on Friday in Algiers at the start Nelson Mandela, a ground where the host nation won all three Group A matches without conceding. And now to Kenya, where Kenya Pipeline came from is set down to reclaim the Kenya Volleyball Federation National Women's League title after a deserved 3-1 win against KCB at the Moy International Sports Center Kasarani Indoor Arena on Sunday. Pipeline last won the title in 2017. With the win, Pipeline have booked an automatic ticket to this year's Africa Club's Championship alongside KCB, who finished second at the end of Sunday's playoff. In netball news, South Africa overcame a charge in England in the dying minutes of the game to salvage a 46 all draw on day two of the netball quad series taking place at the Cape Town International Convention Center, Cape Town South Africa. South Africa made two changes to the side that lost against New Zealand on Saturday. Meanwhile, England were also hoping to redeem themselves following their defeat against Australia in their opening game. In athletics news, Ruth Chipnetic, the 2019 World Marathon Champion, produced two amazing runs at the Kenyan Cross Country Championships, a World Athletics Cross Country Tour Bronze event, to win a pair of titles within an hour at the Kenya Prisons Training College in Ruru on Saturday. Chipnetic sealed her maiden national cross country title, winning in 32 minutes and 54.4 seconds. Chipnetic etched out Sheila Chipkiro to second place by three seconds as the 2021 World Under 20 3000 meters champion Zina Jamutai clocked 33 minutes 06.5 seconds for third place. In the men's category, it was Charles Catul Lecure who edged past Isaac Kibet just before the finish line to win in 29 minutes 16 seconds. And that's it on Daybreak Africa Sports. I am Samson Omale in Abuja, Nigeria. It's back to you, James, in Washington. Thank you, Samson. Have a good Monday. And that's it for this Monday, January 23rd edition.